Good afternoon. <laughs> Welcome to the Entrepreneurship Forum. Today, I, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Zach Nugent. I've known Zach for a lot of years. A lot of years. And um, I can tell you that he's a good man. He's very energetic and um, very motivated. He uh, is the Chief Executive Officer of Scalar Analytics. He's going to talk about that. And uh, he, works with, he works with entrepreneurs and, uh, <coughs> advi and advises developing companies on their management and growth strategies. He's passionate about finance, economics, emerging technologies, and he likes history as well, yeah. but also you like current events. That's right. Okay, yeah, I keep track of you. And um, Zach is a recently married, wonderful lady who is uh, now expecting. She is, yeah. And so congratulations, Dad. Thank you, yeah. Okay, now I'm going to turn the time over to Zach and let, let him talk about what Scalar Analytics does, how it can help you, and I want you to ask questions of him. And he's okay with you if you ask questions as he goes. If you don't understand something, or if you want to tie it into what you do, feel free to ask questions. Okay? Okay, perfect. Yeah. Hey, let's have a hand for Zach. I like to walk around a little bit and talk. I also would consider this more of a forum rather than me just lecture. So I do have a few things I want to discuss with uh, everyone, and then I like to fill questions and, and hopefully be able to you know, provide some value for everybody here. So as Rick mentioned, uh, you know, my, I currently am the CEO of Scalar Analytics. We are a business valuation firm. So we are like a real estate appraiser, but for businesses. And we value businesses really for three purposes, for tax, financial reporting, and transaction advisory purposes. Uh, and we work with companies as early stage, as a kind of an early stage technology startup, all the way to you know, publicly traded companies that trade on the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange. We're headquartered in Salt Lake City, Utah, but we have offices in San Francisco and in Boston as well. Our, our footprint's really nationwide. I'd say the majority of our business is done on either coast. Um, but the majority of our operations are here in Salt Lake City. Um, I've spoken here before, and I've quite enjoyed it. And, and I know it's an entrepreneurial you know, kind of class. And, and uh, so I, I thought about uh, this, this go around that I'd actually, A, bring a, a PowerPoint presentation. Historically, I, I haven't. Uh, but I don't have too many slides. I'm not a slide guy. And the second thing is, I really thought about it. If I were in your shoes, what would I really want to know? Um, you know, and it, it's interesting as I look at as I look at life, business, entrepreneurship. The one thing, the most critical thing, is finding something that you're passionate about and finding something that you really want to do. So you know, you're all in school right now, and you may or may not have an idea of what you want to be doing long term. Um, you may or may not know what you want to be doing in the short term either. So hopefully, I can provide some insight into how to kind of search out. Uh, different opportunities, find out what works best for you, uh, find a passion for it, and then kind of put in place a game plan to go after it. So um, one of the things when I, were, when I was in college, uh, and I attended the University of Utah and graduated in economics, uh, but when I was at the U, um, you know, there were, I didn't really know what I wanted. Uh, I went into the University of Utah uh, to play football. That was my primary motivation, less so much uh, about the world of academia. Um, but what I discovered over time were different interests that I had and how to pursue those interests. If, if I were in your shoes and I was saying to myself, okay, what, am, what do I really want to be doing? There's so many options out there. There's so much available to us today. Um, with you know, uh, the dissemination of information, there are opportunities abound. Um, but the real question is, what really am I interested in? And so what I would encourage folks to do if, is, first and foremost, write down what your professional interests are. So literally, it's as simple of an exercise as, as grabbing a sheet of paper and like writing down what I'm interested in. So it could be some, something as simple as, you know, I like to play video games. You know, I really like to play video games. Is there a job in you know, the gaming industry that I could potentially be interested in? Um, 
the next thing you'd want to write down after that is, you know, um, who do I know? So first thing, obviously, am I interested in it? Second thing I write down, is there a job within this career? The third thing I'd look at and say, do I know somebody uh, in this field that could potentially help me get an introduction? That I could get some information about what's going on. So then I'd write down their names. If you don't know anybody, and that may be very well be the case. For example, you may say, hey, I'm really interested in video games, and I'm really interested in gaming. And um, one of the ways you could do that is you could get on LinkedIn, you could use Facebook, um, you, know, you can talk to other folks that you know, and try to, get some, try to find somebody that knows somebody in that industry. So after you've done that, you kind of write down their names, and then you do something that's incredibly different, as you may want to, you know, it's not as common today, is you pick up the telephone, you call them, and you say, hey, I'm really interested in your industry, I'm really interested in video games, and you know, in fact, I, I, I would love to talk to you about it and get some more insight. Well, what you'll find that's quite amazing is almost everybody will take your call and or email. Um, most people, if you, all you're asking for is their insight, and uh, you're not asking for a job, or you're not trying to sell them something, more than, more than likely people will give you, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes of their time just to provide some insight as to as it relates to a job. Once you've done that, you've had an opportunity to speak with people, I would, I would invite you then to look for opportunities to shadow those people. And what I mean by shadowing somebody is literally taking the opportunity to go literally walk behind them at work. So using the same, same example of video games. I really like to play video games. I like to do something video games. I get uh, an introduction to somebody in Disney Interactive. And from there, I go and I talk with somebody who says, yeah, I'm in the design aspect at Disney Interactive. You say, great, I'd love to just sit and watch you for a day. Literally, you go around, you sit down, and you watch them work. What, it, what, what that will do is it'll give you insight that otherwise you would never have. And over time, as you do that with different disciplines and different interests that you have, it helps you narrow your list and what you really want to do. I actually put together just like a brief kind of a way I would look at it. So once again, I would kind of write down, hey, I'm interested in the video game industry. Um, and from there, I'd write down, hey, I'm interested in maybe potentially being a software developer or maybe in design. And I know somebody at Take-Two Interactive, and I know somebody at Disney. You write down their names, and then you go ahead and you reach out to them and call them and or email them. But it's a really simple way of refining your interests and looking at other opportunities. I remember if I go back when I was in college, I, I really thought to myself, like, what do I really want to do? And a lot of, there was a lot of ambiguity about that. This helps narrow that down and eliminate things that you're really, you may be interested, but you really may not enjoy doing. Uh, and so, uh, after you've gone through this exercise, you've had an opportunity to shadow people, and you've narrowed your list down to maybe two or three different uh, industries or jobs, then I would invite you to then use your network and leverage that network to help you get an internship. And then from an internship, obviously, into a job. Um, so I know um, this is about entrepreneurship. I think that actually, it ties well to entrepreneurship. Uh, I have, I'm really fortunate, I have the opportunity to work with some of the greatest entrepreneurs literally in the world, with some of the, the funnest uh, companies that you read about in the Wall Street Journal or TechCrunch. And I would say not all of them you know, came out of Stanford and immediately started you know, a company. Um, there are a number of them that have, they took experiences that they learned in their previous jobs, leveraged that experience, took that into what they're doing today. So as much as you know, we read about the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world, not everybody's Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, but a lot of people have taken their experiences from different industries and verticals and leveraged that into some type of new business and try to disrupt something they have more information about than somebody else. And you get that by experience. You get that by being passionate about something. That passion comes by doing something you enjoy. And you don't really know what you enjoy until you get exposure. And so that exposure comes by doing this process of elimination. So it's a, it's a way to accelerate that process of, process of elimination versus just taking a job, two years later taking a new job, two years later taking a new job. It accelerates that. Um, so that's, that's kind of my first insight that I would like to, if I were in your shoes, that'd be something that I really want to know, is how I can get exposure to different interests that I have and really quickly do a process of elimination as to whether or not this is something I want to pursue a career in. Um, so let's say, for example, I've taken, let's do video games, and I have the opportunity to go work in the video game industry. 
Uh, I'm really big into, um, let's say it's mobile gaming, and I've done really well in mobile gaming. And I feel like after working at, you know, let's say Disney Interactive for you know, some duration of time, I feel I can start my own app. I have this really interesting gaming uh, application I want to I wanna deploy, and I'm gonna go ahead and go do that. I'm gonna leave Disney, I'm gonna go start my own company. Now, what would I do if I were going to go start my own company? Um, I started with Scalar, and to kind of give you a little bit more background with myself, I started at Scalar when Scalar was literally two people in an executive office space. Now we're a small boutique, there are 24 people spread across the country, uh, and we've been, we've been very fortunate in that we've had a very um, robust growth over the last five years. So I do have exposure to this. Prior to running Scalar, I actually ran a technology company. I ran a uh, company called America Home Today. Uh, we focused on user-generated contact and lead generation. And so, um, and then my two experiences, which I think are on my bio, I'm currently not in, involved with though. I formerly was on the board of advisors of 10X Networks, which is a hardware technology company. Um, I subsequently have kind of stepped down from that role. I still have a close relationship with the CEO. Uh, and then the other company is CapShare, which was, I was part of the founding team of that. It's a company trying to disrupt um, really cap table management and valuation via kind of technology. Um, and no longer with that board of directors as well, but I obviously have exposure and experience there. So if I were, going back to my analogy, if I'm sitting at Disney and I'm saying to myself, okay, I'm leaving, I'm gonna go start my mobile app company, I think there's something really interesting here. I have a mobile application, I think that could disrupt the market. Um, what would I do first? The first thing I personally would do is I would look at who I want to partner with. I'm a big, big, big believer that you can't do everything by yourself. It's literally impossible. So the idea to think that you're going to come out of the chutes, you're going to own 100% of the pie, you're going to be the man, I, I just don't see it. I've, I've literally, we have, and at Scalar we have you know, more than 1,100 clients and, and I would say of all those, everybody deals with a great, fantastic team. And this is something that's really important lesson uh, as you start a company or if you look to join a company or uh, really just if you're going to, in life in general, it's, it's all about your team. So I, I put the question up there, you know, what do startups, ba Duke Basketball, Urban Meyer, and Google all have in common? Anybody? Teamwork. But even more so than teamwork is that they recruit and they try to retain the very best players. So let's use Duke basketball, for example. If you look at Duke basketball over the course of you know, the last 20 years, how many McDonald's All-Americans have gone to play at Duke? I, I, I don't know the number, but I would imagine it's quite high. If you look at anywhere in their, their starting lineup, the starting five they have, they're probably three of the five are McDonald's All-Americans, if not all five. The reason why Duke is so successful in a perennial top 10 basketball team is Duke recruits the very best players. And the very best players want to go play at Duke. You could make the same argument about Google. You can make the same argument about Urban Meyer. And the reason I use Urban Meyer is obviously this won the national championship and Ohio State you know, is the national champion. But you can look at it, Ohio State, once again, you could make a strong argument that they have some of the best, if not the best players in the country. Okay. You were coach at the U as well? Yeah, I did. I was fortunate enough to play under Urban Meyer for uh, a short duration of time as well. Yeah. So team is incredibly important. You can literally not get ahead. You cannot be successful without having a very, very strong team. Okay. So if I'm in your shoes, if I'm starting this company and I'm, just use the example, I'm a mobile application company, a mobile gaming company, and I, um, I want to get started, I'm going to partner with the very best people. Okay. Now that can be hard, okay? Because we we have naturally we have constraints upon you know access. So how do we get access to the very best people? How do we learn from the very best people? How do we get exposure to the very be best people? That in itself it can be a full time job, and that comes via your ability to network. It comes based off of your dedication to getting to know um, more people via not only you know, social media, but also actually getting out and meeting people. Taking that same analogy that I used on the checklist of trying to find something you're interested in, you could also use that for trying to find people that you're interested in getting connected with that could potentially, you could bring on your team. Um, it is in itself, if I would encourage you guys, is to invest heavily in A, yourself, but B, invest heavily in your network. 
and as you and as you go as you grow professionally over time, you're able to leverage your network not only for your benefit but for their benefit as well. I'm a big believer as you as you gain a network, look for opportunities to add value versus take value. And it's kind of the law of karma. You kind of get what you give. I'm a big believer in that. If you look for ways to help people, they may not help you directly, but indirectly, usually it comes back to pay you know, dividends and spades. So um, that would be my suggestion if I was starting. Make sure I form the very best team, OK? But once you have a great idea, let's see my mobile application, you know, my gaming company, I've, I have a great team. The next thing, and this is something you really can't get around, is you gotta have hard work. And I, I, I put this in hard work, what? Hard work, serious? Really what people forget is that to get ahead in life, the people that really work hard and work smart are the ones that get ahead. The notion that you're going to be you know, at the top of the pyramid by putting in the minimum amount of effort it's just not a reality. It's never going to happen. It doesn't happen. The people that get ahead in life, they push themselves. They're always working hard. It is, it is the outliers that come across opportunities and experiences um, that, that pay dividends that they really didn't put much work in. But the majority of people, the people that have really been successful in life, they have a strong work ethic. And uh, I have a couple of, uh, of things I want to highlight on this topic because I think this is important. I think this is important uh, for just everybody in general. But I, I think the, the first thing I want to hit on, especially an entrepreneur, the first thing is Randy Posh. Is anybody familiar with who Randy Posh is? Who's Randy Posh? Yeah, didn't he have cancer? He did. Uh, he did like motivational speaking at his university. Right. Yeah, so he worked at Carnegie Mellon. Yep, bingo. Perfect, yep. So Randy Posh was a professor at Carnegie Mellon University. And uh, on it's, and I'm just going to briefly recapitulate his story, but it's helpful for you guys. He got pancreatic cancer. He was dying. It was terminal. He knew about it. And so each professor, when they have an opportunity to retire, they usually allow them to have a last lecture. Randy was a fairly young person. I, I don't know his exact age. I'd say he's probably in his early 40s. And Randy got diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. It was terminal, he was going to die. So Randy had an opportunity to go in and actually give a last lecture. Um, and so he, he gave this last lecture. It became viral, became really, really popular. It went you know, all over YouTube. And then he ended up writing a book um, called The Last Lecture. I, it's a really quick read. It's, it's got some tidbits from Randy Posh. I'd recommend it. It's, it's literally, it's probably 200 pages. But what Randy says, there's one topic in it, and I really believe in this strongly, he calls it Friday nights. One of the things that Randy was able to do that most professors aren't able to do in his same duration of time is he became tenured at a very young age. And when people asked Randy, how did you become tenured at such a young age? Randy said, Friday nights. He said, on Friday nights, when everybody had left the office, I was still working. He goes, that's the difference between me and everybody else, is that on Friday nights, I was putting in the extra effort. I was the one pushing myself while everybody else had left to go play for the weekend. So where can you, what do I like about that? What I like about that is to be a successful entrepreneur, to be successful um, at running a business and to create something from nothing, which is really entrepreneurship in so many ways, you need to be able to live the mantra of Friday nights because you can't really get there without putting in the time. And hard work really, you just, there's no replacement for it. Um, I want, I, the second bullet point, here's a perfect analogy. I'm going to give you a real story, kind of, but kind of with the, with the caveat that this is from my perspective. So I know two, pl I know two baseball players. Both baseball players, extreme, both play, baseball players were talented. Okay? One was less talented than the other. The one that was less talented, I would say he was an average baseball player. That's about it, an average baseball player. The other baseball player came with every single you know, um, you know, think of, talent you could imagine. He was fast, he had great hands, he could, he could hit the ball uh, either left-handed or right-handed, he could throw either left-handed or right-handed. Um, you know, he, he, he could eat a you know, double cheeseburger and he looked like he had the body of you know, a Greek god. He just had everything going for him. So you had one on one end and the other one was just an average, good baseball player, but average. Not anywhere, it didn't look anywhere near the same as the other baseball player. But the one thing he had that the other guy didn't is he had work ethic. And this is, and I'm saying, this is as, as my, as my you know, vantage point, and I know both these people. So if you look at it, one of them truly 
sacrificed. He went to the batting cages and he religiously hit balls and he went after it every single day. He spent hour after hour after hour and he just dedicated himself fully to his sport. While the other person, he practiced, went to games, did okay. They both went on to play college. Very similar experience. What ends up happening is the one that was very talented eventually realized that his talent couldn't carry him and the same work ethic didn't exist that the other player had. And when it became time to move on to that next level, the very talented player was no better than the other guy because he had spent so much time becoming so refined at his skill set. And eventually, talent runs out without hard work. The, as I look at this, the, both these gentlemen, one went on to play in the bigs and uh, the big leagues and played in Major League Baseball for quite a, quite a uh, long time. The other one ended up, uh, you know, kind of after college baseball, ended up not playing any, uh, anymore. So kind of gives you two different analogies as what hard work can do, which kind of I'm going to jump down to kind of this growth mindset by Carol Dweck, which is uh, something I would encourage everybody to do, which is to read a book called Growth Mindset. Um, there's a TED Talk about it. Uh, it's actually indirectly about Carol Dweck, but um, nevertheless, it's still um, a, a good read. What it basically talks about and what her thesis is, is there's two different mindsets. There's a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. And the fixed mindset really basically says, you're only as good with what you've been endowed with. So if I've only been, I've been endowed with, um, let's say, for example, using my same analogy on baseball, I'm, I'm really, really good at hitting the ball left-handed, and that's what I've been endowed with. Um, and what the mentality behind the fixed mindset is, you really can't get much better than what you've been given. Conversely, the growth mindset would suggest that, hey, I've been given, I have some talent, but I can take that talent and I can expound upon that by hard work, by discipline, by being smart about my training. And so the same can be said about business and entrepreneurship. When we think about it in this context, is that it's not always about what you've been given, it's about how you take what you've been given and making it something better. And it's having the belief system in yourself that you can, that you can do that. Everybody can get a little bit better. It's not just what you've been given. And we've all been given a different hand. Everybody's been dealt a different hand. The question is, what are you going to do with your hand? How are you going to take that hand and expound upon it and become better? And that is a personal decision that each one of you have to make, is how do you do the next, how do you get better? How do you do more than what you've been given? And my, I strongly encourage you to do this, which is never give up. Resistance truly is to make you better. It's not to prevent you from getting ahead. And, the, and, and when you're uncomfortable, that's actually a good place to be because it says that you're growing and you're learning. It's when we get really comfortable where we become stagnant. And like you don't want to be stagnant. The worst thing in business is to be comfortable and stagnant because there are always people disrupting. There are always people coming after you. And so being stagnant is not a good place to be. Constantly be trying to improve. That's that growth mindset. Always be looking ways to improve. Take what you've been given, expound upon it. So that would be the, the next principle that I talk about, hard work. There really isn't a replacement for hard work. I guess in conclusion, I like, this is, people judge success in all different shapes or forms. And I really like Ray Dalio's definition of success. And so for those who don't know Ray Dalio, I'll give you another book to read. Um, it, Ray Dalio is uh, the founder of a hedge fund called Bridgewater and Associates. Uh, it's the largest hedge fund with assets under management. You can go to his website, and he has, on his website, he has something called Principles. You can download it, print it, read it. It's great. It's honestly, I advocate it. I call it the, the Bible for business. Um, I really love what he's written here. Basically, the ethos of this come to when Ray had been asked, on, and he talks about this in the, in the preface of, of, of Principles. Basically, people would ask him, Hey, Ray, how are you so successful? Why have you become so successful? So what he basically did was he took what are principles to him and he outlined them in a manuscript of probably like 120 pages or something along those lines. I mean, he spent a lot of time on this. But what he did was he really provided the roadmap of how he became successful. And, um, and there's some, you'd have to read it, but you're going to see uh, some of it may be applicable for you, some of it may not be applicable. But, but there are some really great underlying life lessons that are extremely important. And, the first, and the, this is his definition of success I, I couldn't agree with more, which is, so what is success? I believe there's nothing more than getting what you want. And that is up, for you, and that is up to you to decide what it is for you. I don't care whether it's being a master of the universe, a couch potato, or anything else. I really don't. What is essential is that you are clear about what you want and that you figure out how to get it. And that is 
the million dollar question, and literally it is a million dollar question, to figure out what it is you really want. So hopefully, if we kind of go through the, pr the progression of the principles that we talked about, one, trying to sort through different opportunities um, to be able to find what you really are interested in. Once you find what you're interested, getting that experience that's necessary to potentially go out and start something on your own. Once you do go out and start something on your own, building a team around yourself and hiring people that are smarter than you and better than you. And then third, putting in work ethic and, having, and, and going the extra mile beyond what you think is possible. And that in itself will result in success. And, the, and success is, comes in varying degrees. And that will be up to you to decide what is successful, you know, what if or not it will be successful. But if you kind of follow that course and that progression, I'm a firm believer that the outcome is usually positive. Uh, and it helps entrepreneurs really, really succeed. Yeah. Was it always your dream to be an entrepreneur? Did you always know you wanted to do that? No, I didn't. My dream was to play football. And at 22 years of age, I had to readjust. So I went through a very similar experience to what I described here. So when I grew up, you know, I was probably less inter interested in entrepreneurship. And entrepreneurship kind of comes in varying degrees. Um, and uh, literally, I kind of went through a journey in my early 20s and kind of discovered what I was interested in uh, after having exposure to different industries and verticals. And then I kind of pursued my career in that direction. What were some of the ways you dealt with the low points in your entrepreneurship? <laughs> I've had a lot of low points. Um, so it's interesting. So I'll give you a, a failure story. So uh, in 2006, I was part of a startup called America Home Today. We were tackling the um, construction market. If you're familiar with like Angie's List, um, we were trying to create user-generated content about contractors. So the idea behind it was, hey, I need to go get a tile setter for my bathroom. Who do I use? I can get in the phone book, which is really an antiquated way to contact people. I can go ask somebody at Home Depot, or I could Google it, okay? And Google searches were obviously not as refined as they are today. Yelp was just kind of getting started. So there were still a number of other means, and Angie's List was kind of popular. So we figured, hey, what the heck? We can compete with Google, Yelp, and Angie's List. We'll just throw ourselves in there. So we, we, went, after, we went after that market, and what ended up happening, we raised some cash, raised it from investors, and we decided to go after this home run, and, and um, what ended up happening, it became very apparent that it's a chicken and egg type business, meaning to get all of the con get all the service providers, if you will, onto our website, and then and our business model was they would pay to be on our website, and then we would get people that have used them to give ratings and reviews, and then we kind of build our traffic that way. It became very difficult, and our business model was it, it was it was a chicken and egg. We could get the service providers on the website, but it was hard to get the content. And if the content did come, it was all negative. And once it was all negative, the contractors would say, I don't want to be part of your site anymore. So then they'd get off the site. So it was one of those things where our paying customer would get on with the idea of generating business, but more than likely were getting negative reviews and they weren't getting business, so they said, I don't want to be part of it. So it became kind of this really difficult medium to like navigate. And we had raised all this money and like we had responsibility to shareholders and, and, and other people. And so as we went through this process of trying to figure out how to navigate this business model, and so do we pivot, do we not pivot? And we started making some adjustments and we tried to generate traffic in a multiple variety of different means. And in the end, what ended up happening was, you know, ultimately we looked at the business, and I think economic factors were in consideration as well, but I'm not a big believer in like blaming outside conditions. Ultimately, the business model wasn't a success, and we ended up having to wind the company down. And, and ever having to wind a company down is, is extremely difficult because, one, you've dedicated your whole heart and soul to something, and you've put in, you know, long hours, you've sacrificed a lot to do that. And then the third thing is you have shareholders, and I have to report back to shareholders, and that's a fun conversation. When you go sit down to your shareholder and say, yeah, you wrote a check and you said, hey, I invested in you, and you said, sorry, your money's all gone. So that's always a fun conversation to have with people. Um, but in the end, what doesn't break you makes you stronger, and I think those experiences are really good because they help you learn from those moments and you understand what to do differently the next time. Um, so I've had ups and downs. That's a low moment. How do I deal with low moments? Man, um, I, you work out or you know, try to keep your mind uh, preoccupied. You've got to do something to keep yourself sane. Um, you know, mind, I tend to, I use exercise as probably my medium to really alleviate stress. 
But you know, they're going to come. I mean, tough moments come in everybody's life. The question is, how do you deal with them? Great question. Thank you. Yeah. How do you go about raising capital and getting investors? What's the best channels to find those if you are trying to start a business? Yeah. Um, so I, I, I work for investors. So part of what I do is I actually value venture capital and private equity funds for their mark-to-market accounting. And uh, I've also been on the other side of it where I ra- have raised capital. And so um, I would say the best way to do it is your network. So it kind of goes back to that step is um, initially when you're starting an idea, literally just bang on. I-, I would raise money from family and friends initially, people that already know you. Most people don't invest in ideas. They invest in people. Even at the highest level, they'll invest in people. They don't always invest in ideas. Um, you want to repeat that? Yeah, most <laughs> most investors will invest in people they don't invest in ideas. Um, you'll hear this. I mean, this is an analogy that's been used a lot. Is you bet on you bet you bet on the jockey, not the horse. Um, if you look at you look at venture funds and private equity funds, uh, private equity slightly I mean, private equity is different. So let's talk venture. If you look at venture. You know, a lot of it's all based off your network. It's based off somebody that knows you, that has some, you know, experience having worked with you. Um, And then the other thing, too, is once you've done it once, to go get the money to do it again becomes significantly easier um, because you're a proven commodity, because you've already done it. Once again, you're betting on the jockey, not the horse. And so if I'm going to start a business and I was going to go out, I would do the same kind of principles that I outlined here. The first thing is, is I'd say, okay, who do I know that potentially could invest in my company? Okay, so I'd write down those names. Um, and then I would literally either, and you may not know them personally, you just say, who do I know that could potentially list it? So you'd write them down. So let's say I know two or three individuals, and I've heard of two or three angel funds, and I heard two or three venture capital funds. And then I'd say, who knows somebody within that community? Now, venture is different because there's going to be, within venture, there's criteria associated with their investment thesis. So let's use an example of local investors. If, I'm a, if I am looking for a investment capital here and I'm an early stage startup, meaning I'm in the infancy idea stage, I may have some product, some development, I'm not going to go talk to Pelion Ventures. So Pelion Ventures is a local venture fund in Salt Lake City because Pelion looks at later stage venture capital deals. Okay, I'm, not, I'm gonna go talk to maybe a Kickstart, okay? And you're gonna talk with maybe a Gra- Gavin Christensen. And Gavin's more in the earlier stage, kind of initial investment stage, okay? So you, you wanna know who your audience is and what their investment thesis is because that will dictate whether or not you have conversations. And you wanna be educated when you go into these meetings. And to get a meeting, it's usually you have to know somebody that knows somebody to get you in. If you send an email, they'll. I'm telling you, if you, they say, "Hey, contact us with an idea," that's a nice, um, you know, PR. They're never really going to follow up with you, and they don't invest in those deals anyway. I, I bet you, if you pooled and you looked at the numbers, the amount of deals they've invested in on an inbound lead, I, I don't know, relatively nominal. I mean, it's probably a fraction of the overall deals that they've ever, that ever, ever been done. So, okay. that that's kind of my advice on that. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, what was your major going into the year? University of Going in, undecided. Okay. Coming, co- coming out, economics. Okay. Yeah. Economics. I, I mean, I don't, I don't know if I am like, I don't have a, you know, a, probably the best academic, you know, um, you know, history, if you will. Uh, what I, I went into school. Truly, I went into school to play football, and I came out recognizing I needed to be doing something much different. After I realized I'm a slow, you know, not that big person, I pretty much, you know. Um, I probably needed to do something else. Um, that's why I, I started, what would I do if I were in your shoes? If I, if I, knowing what I know now, what would I, what would I try to tell people? If, if you're still undecided, if you haven't really made that decision yet, it's a great exercise. Literally, go through and write down everything you're interested in. And you shouldn't, as a brainstorming session, honestly, you shouldn't uh, like say no to anything. So like, I've heard of accountants. I don't even know what they really do. You know, I, I kind of want to be a doctor, but I don't know if I really would like that. You know, maybe a nurse. You know, and so you write down what you do know, and then go out and talk to people and get exposure and, and get an understanding. And once you've, even now, you can refine that list down. So once you need to decide on your major, you can say, OK, I've had the opportunity. I've gotten some exposure to different things. I think this is a really good major for me. Okay, it gives you exposure to that. 
that helps you refine that. And then truthfully, even once you're in the major, you're probably gonna then wanna do the same exercise again because within any major, there's different areas you can go. Yeah, like with business, you have like management, administration, marketing. Yeah, yeah like business is such a, yeah, it's such, I, my personal opinion is I would get, I would have a more specialized degree than just business. Right. That's my personal opinion. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think specialization, you, you, I look at my, so in, in, in my, at Scalar. So when we hire people out of undergraduate school at Scalar. Um, if somebody comes with a general business degree or a finance degree, I will hire the finance degree usually 10 out of 10 times. Right. And the reason being is because the finance degree has, understands what our core competency is. Okay, and the business degree may or may not have some because they didn't take the same classes. So in our world, you have to really understand your core finance. And so it's a little bit, even accounting, like I've, we, we've hired accountants as well. And if you're accounting finance, that's like ideal for our world. Okay. And so it's, you know, you kind of have to, you have to have exposure to exactly what we do. And so at Scalar, I'll give you an example, when we hire somebody, it's uh, multiple interviews. It's a case study on what we do. It's a technical exam. It's checking references, and then we extend an offer. So it's, it's multiple layers, but the ideal people we like to hire, interns. Truthfully, I mean, honestly, I like to hire people that have gone through an internship at our program and have worked with us because it gives two things. One, yes, we've kind of gone through that vetting process, but one, they've, got to, they've had the opportunity to work with us, so they know us. They've <coughs> kind of seen all the skeletons, you know, if you, if you know what I mean. And, and, and then, and then the, the reverse, we've gotten to see them. Right. And so we can make an assessment and say yes or no. So that's why I recommend kind of doing a very similar process. Shadowing Yeah, I mean, shadow a lot of people. People, I mean, honestly, people are flattered. You call them on the phone and say, hey, I just want to sit in your office and like learn a little bit about you today. And they'll be like, all right, cool, you can come in. I mean, most people are that way. Yeah. And if they're not, then you just go find somebody else because nobody has like a total monopoly on a, on a Job. I mean, there's, there's a ton of opportunity out there. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. What's your opinion on um, buying existing companies as a means to start? Kind of. Yeah, it's not a bad. It's not a bad uh, move. I, and, I would. Yeah. Go ahead. And what would be like the best way to go about it? And like, what would be the most important thing to look at? So. I've, I've actually purchased a company. So I would, I would say, um, one, I personally would only get into an industry that I had experience with. So I think that's an important element when buying a business, is you have some experience, you have exposure to the market, you understand what you're getting in for. Um, that would be the first thing. The second thing is, honestly, it's what team can I put together to help me with this business? If I can't put together an A team, you know, then I don't know if I'm interested in building that business. So one, do I have experience? Two, is it an A team? And then three, honestly, then I kind of look in the, to what's the, the status of the company. But that's probably my third step versus the other first two, um, for me personally. Um, you know, but every, every, you know, sometimes financial sponsors, which a financial sponsor could be, you know, a, a, a private equity firm, which is more somebody that would purchase a firm or strategic that would be like a public company to buy a company. They may look at it slightly different. Um, but more or less, they're going to know the industry. You don't see a private equity firm that focuses on life science companies buying, you know, a desk manufacturer. They focus on the industry they really, really know. Um, and a strategic, for example, which is a large public company or, or even a privately held company that buys another company, they're usually buying something that's either um, related to their business or it's a nice complement to their business. So once again, that, that principle probably holds fast and true for those. And then the team is like a huge element. I mean, you really can't build a business without great colleagues and partners. And I'm a big advocate, one plus one equals five. I mean, it really does. Uh, I know the math doesn't make sense, but you know, the analogy does. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, what do you recommend for like a college student that is sticking with like business, but also wants to someday in the future work in like the mobile cloud technology industry? Yeah. Um, so. 
So I think, at, at not, not the gate, just like general business isn't a good degree. So, but I would focus on, this kind of goes to the element, if you're interested in, in kind of mobile cloud, I would try to take some uh, computer programming classes. Get familiar with different programming languages. Um, because, it, and it depends on what kind of vertical within that industry you want to focus. So I have friends that do digital advertising or digital marketing. They work within, they could work within a business under a certain vertical. So you don't necessarily have to be a developer to work at a technology company. But you know, having exposure and understanding some of the principles beyond just what you kind of read about, like in a Wall Street Journal or something, that's very helpful. So it, anytime you can get more information and more education about the industry that you're interested in, it's better. Um, general business is a good degree to have, but it doesn't really specialize. You're not specialized in anything. Uh, do you recommend like, getting a minor or in a certain area, yes? Yeah, I, I, I'm a big believer in specialization. I'm a big believer in pursuing your passions, finding something you're interested in, and then getting the education and the knowledge and the know-how to be able to be the most, to be the best at that position you possibly can. So yes, minoring can be an opportunity. So we used to use Scalar, for example. If somebody came with a, greater, with a business major and a minor in finance, probably gonna work. That will work fine for us. As long as they have the, inf as long as they come in with the understanding of the core competency, so that comes based on familiarity with our industry. You can do that without, like for example, one of the sharpest people we've ever hired, or you know, you probably look at it and um, they may or may not have had that finance undergrad. They may have had another degree, you know. So um, I'm trying to think of somebody at our firm that that uh, doesn't have a finance degree that that's been quite successful. I mean, accounting. So accounting, accounting and finance are, are are very similar, but they're very different in some ways. Um, so sometimes we can take really good accountants and we can, and they become very, very good at finance. But part of that is they're very much interested in it and they have a core competency related to it. Is that, is that, hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, that helps, thanks. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on like certifications? Like for like, they're just like say like account and finance. Like yeah, uh, yeah, I think it's incredibly important. Like getting as much education as you can and differentiating yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, competition today, I mean, Thomas Friedman's right, man, the world is flat. So the notion of thinking that you're just competing with everybody in this class is not even close to accurate. You're, you're competing with the guy in California, in New York, in India, in China. I mean, and the appetite for hard work and success and drive, you'd be surprised. Emerging, emerging countries, I, I mean, I work, I compete against some of these countries, and I'm telling you, they're competitive. They'll, they all cannot work you if you don't work hard. And people are, in you know, those, they're getting the same credentials you're getting. You know, and, you know, for example, I look at India, is just, uh, that economy is incredible. And the amount of people that are educated, that educated workforce, it's, it's pretty impressive. I mean, so it's, yeah, so getting as much education as you can, differentiating yourself is, is highly important, and specializing, in my opinion, becomes critical in, in your thought process as you pursue your career. Yeah? Um, what are your feelings about getting involved in the community through different types of community service in order to network? I, I think it's great. Um, I think any time you get involved in the community, you should do something you're really passionate about. Um, I, I, it's kind of disingenuous when you go into, a, for example, some type of community organization and you're really not that interested and it's just for networking. Usually it can weed people out like that and people don't like to really associate with those folks. But if you're really passionate about something in the community, getting involved leads to a lot of opportunities. Um, but I would pick something you're really interested in and have the networking be an element of that, but not the primary objective. The primary objective should be something you're really, really interested in. Um, because then you'll dedicate all of your efforts towards that versus just trying to get the networking. That's my opinion on it. There's another hand. Yeah. Did you end up getting any game time at the end? Yeah, I got scrub time. You know, about fourth quarter when you were walking out. Yeah, exactly. When you were walking out of the, uh, when you guys were probably leaving the stadium, it's when my parents were like cheering and all super excited. Do you consider it a success, though, personally, to be able to at least make it to that stage, even if it wasn't what you ended up doing? 
Yeah, I, I, I enjoyed my time there. I learned a lot. It's the lessons I learned in you know my late teens and early twenties was uh, you know is invaluable to who I am today. So yeah, I mean, the the thing I got the most discipline, camaraderie, and uh, you know you have to you have to work hard. So yeah, it was a success. Definitely was. Even though I you know you'd never heard of me before. So yeah, it was a success. <laughs> What's your opinion on LinkedIn? Love it. I use LinkedIn every day. Yeah. I recruit off LinkedIn. I network off LinkedIn. I use LinkedIn every day. I pay like $120 a month to be on LinkedIn. Yeah. But I, but I use it for recruiting. So in our industry, a lot of the people that do what we do don't reside in the state of Utah. If you're experienced in what we do, they usually reside on either coast. So I, I use it for recruiting purposes primarily. And then I use it to make sure I connect with my clients, make sure I stay in touch with it, what they're doing. Because a lot of times, they'll send updates hey, we've done this, or we've done this. It's nice to know what your clients are doing. Stay in touch. Yeah, I, I really like LinkedIn. It's a, great, it's a great medium to keep a pulse on, on your network. But there's, but there's more to networking than that. Once, once you have a network and you kind of keep a pulse, it's always nice to send out other emails or try to grab coffee or lunch or spend time with the folks with whom you network with. Um, it's, it, that in itself is an investment. And it's an investment of time, but it's, trust me, it's worth it. Yeah. Okay, beyond social media, how do you grow your networking group? Uh, it's, it's good. It's a good question. Um, so I, getting involved in the community is one way. You know, picking something you're interested in. You know, networking comes based off of, you know, groups of individuals. So um, look for conferences. Look for... Um, um, Meetups, and there are like literally hundreds of organizations across the country that specialize in creating networking opportunities for people. So they're all over the place. Um, but more than that is, if you want to network with somebody specifically, you can go through an exercise where you say, "Okay, what I really want right now, for example, is let's say I'm, I really want to know. I want to revamp my website. So Scalar, we're revamping our website." And we were re when we started the process, I said, okay, I know some people already, and I have experience with some designers, and this is for graphic design. I know some graphic designers, but I want to get exposure to other graphic designers. And so one of the things I did was I called some of my friends. I said, hey, who are you working with? You know, who do you know? So I could use LinkedIn. I like About, about Me as well for graphic designers. It has, they have more graphic designers. And you can go through these and try to find different people. And then I try to, that's, and then I try to connect with some type of common person that's worked with them in the past. But, so I do use LinkedIn, I do use About Me, I, I call people I know. Um, you know, it, I, the internet's ubiquitous, man. It's got everything. So if you just kind of just use it to your benefit, but it takes somebody being proactive to the next step. That's, that's the difference is that once you know about the conference, you have to go to the conference. And once you're in the conference, here's the, the, the hard thing is going up to Jonathan and saying, hi, Jonathan, I'm Zach. John, it's nice doing? to meet you. That's hard for people, you know? And so, and, and, it's, and it's not easy for me yet, but it, when I do it, it gets me out of my comfort zone. We go back to one of my, my points, which was, you know, if you're comfortable, you're probably not it's probably a bad thing. You want to be. You, you probably want to be like trying to get out of that comfort zone a little bit. You never want to. You never want to be the smartest guy in the room. Like that's always a bad thing. You know. You just always want to make sure you're hiring smarter people. It's like tennis, man. I, I, don't, I know I'm going off on a tangent here. You don't want to play tennis with people that are not. A, you, you always want to play tennis with someone slightly better than you. You don't ever want to play with people you can like kill. There's like no point in that exercise. <laughs> So I, that's what I would do. I mean, I would look online. I would say, like, medians you can go to. They're, like, pretty good. Um, locally, there's, like, Beehive Start. I mean, it depends on what industry you're interested in, too. So I'll give you startup stuff. Like, Beehive Startup's really interesting. That's, like, a kind of new vehicle. Um, like, I look at Silicon Slopes. They, they invest heavily in that stuff. That keeps you appraised of what's going on in networking here. You go to a couple of those networking meetings, and they, you learn about other networking meetings. You know, and then they go to other networking meetings. Um, there's like a, uh, an adult fraternity called Corporate Alliance that you can pay decent money to, and you know, people go and they network. I've actually been to those before. They're kind of fun. Um, but there, you know, there are all different ways you can do it. Um, not all LinkedIn, by the way. I actually like LinkedIn for staying in touch and making contact, and that's a, 
where I really like LinkedIn. LinkedIn's not building a, you don't build a relationship on LinkedIn. You build that by spending time with people. Okay. Did you have your question? Uh, yeah, I was just gonna ask like the recruiting process for LinkedIn. Like what do you go, like is it like the same pretty much? When I'm, uh, when I'm like. Like when you're like searching for like. Uh, yeah, so they have like a recruiter. They have a yeah. recruiter link that you can go to. It's actually kind of neat. It's kind of nice because it shows me how many times I've viewed people, if I've sent them messages. Is that um, like the pro it's not the pro, it's the recruiter for small businesses. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's pretty it's a nice it's a nice little tool. I get a lot, you know, you get a number of in mail contacts and I try to send people just I try to be short. I used to send long emails and now I'm sending a lot shorter emails. Oh, okay. I'm getting more response that way. Um, and that in itself, I mean I'm not an HR expert. <laughs> We're a small business, but you know, so I try to, uh, I try to be as direct and as I can. So keep your eyes open and stay alert, and uh, you can do it. Zach Nugent, was that good? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.